So I wanted to start by just sharing an email that I received uh, the other day. And, and I don't normally spend a lot of time reading these kinds of emails, but this one was particularly troubling to me. And I wanted to share a little bit from that. So the subject line was, who really died at Auschwitz? And then it said, this is a direct quote from the email, the following is a copy of an article written by Spanish writer Sebastian Villar Rodriguez and published in a Spanish newspaper. And then this is what he'd written. I walked down the streets in Barcelona and suddenly discovered a terrible truth. Europe died in Auschwitz. We killed six million Jews and replaced them with 20 million Muslims. In Auschwitz, we burned a culture, thought, creativity, talent. We destroyed the chosen people, truly chosen, because they produced great and wonderful people who changed the world. And then it continued. The contribution of these people is felt in all areas of life, science, art, international trade, and above all, as the conscience of the world. These are the people we burn. That, I, I, didn't, I didn't have much to disagree with in that part of the email, but then this part came next. And under the pretense of tolerance, and because we wanted to prove to ourselves that we were cured of the disease of racism, we opened our gates to 20 million Muslims who brought us stupidity, and ignorance, religious extremism, lack of tolerance, crime, and poverty due to an unwillingness to work and support their families with pride. And at first, I'd received this from an acquaintance. I was quite shocked that they would forward a message like this. And so I, I composed a reply, and, and this was the, the reply that I first wrote. Uh, this article is a chilling reminder, not only that the Holocaust occurred, but how it occurred. It's hateful rhetoric such as this, repeated with enough frequency and intensity in enough settings and to enough people that nurtures a generation who's capable of committing unthinkable acts against their fellow humans, supposing that they're doing good. Before I sent the, the, this reply, though, I thought, uh, I want to I wanna find out a little bit more about this article. I want to know where, where it really came from. And so I started to look into the source of this article. And what I found is that the, the source is, is, there's kind of this nebulous source. The person who supposedly wrote the email or wrote the article in Spain uh, doesn't really exist, or there's some questions about whether he exists or not. He probably used a pseudonym in writing. This was published online rather than in a newspaper, like it said in the email. And as I started to think through it, the purpose of this, I think, was really propaganda. And as I've worked with students in the past, and we talk about propaganda, we to me, and my understanding of propaganda is that the whole purpose of that is to move people from feelings to actions. And so it's not, propaganda is not so much to change people's minds about an issue, but to move them from kind of moderate feelings to strong feelings. And so I, I assume that the audience for this email would be people who uh, moderately agree with this idea that the you know that this, this hateful talk about Muslims and I think people who may agree with that to some extent might feel really strongly about an email like this and might be moved to some kind of action from it and with, with that background on the source I realized eh, it's probably not worth sending a reply or really thinking much more ab about this topic but uh, the, the other thing that this experience brought to mind with this email was that we're living in a, a day and age where with the internet we have access to information in a way that we need to be critical readers and we need to foster the, that kind of critical thinking in our our students as well and so what I want to focus on as I'm speaking is how can we nurture young people's historical reading and writing how can, how can nurturing them prepare them for adulthood? And I would say part of adulthood is being able to handle emails like that with 
wisdom and prudence and responding in a, in a way that makes sense. Um, and so the, the two main things that I'm going to talk about are this idea of critical participation and uh, empathetic dispositions. And so I'll, I'll kind of focus on those two things. Am I coming through all right? Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying so far? Perfectly, perfectly well, thanks. Okay. As a teacher, I really, my style, I really depend a lot on uh, interaction. And so if, if you have comments or questions or you want further clarification, then please uh, feel free to, to uh, speak up. And, and, uh, and normally I'm pretty sensitive to that when I'm in person with people, but you're a long ways away, and so I may may not notice if you have something that you want to add, so you may have to just interrupt, and feel free to do that. Uh, so I want to talk, first of all, about critical participation, and I would make the same offer to my students. I'm, I have my back to them as well, so I can't tell whether they're, yeah, they have things to say or want to ask a question or contribute either, so, so uh, feel free to interrupt. Uh, so this idea of critical participation, first of all, I want to show you some other kind of personal uh, things like that email. So this is, this is an ad that I received not too long ago. Actually, it was for last year's election. And as I, as I look at this ad, it's just really, it, it's kind of comical to me because the question is, who really represents your values? And then we have these two images. We have a blurry person with a, an unfriendly face <laughs> captured at just the wrong moment. And then we have, you know, a clear and, and uh, uh, person who, you know, obviously was ready for the photograph. And so the question again is asked, who really represents your values? And so as I look at this email or this mailer that I receive in the mail, I think, yeah, does a blurry woman represent my values, or does a clear man represent my values? And that's really all I have to go on, on this from this uh, this advertisement. On the back, it lays out back of this. It lays out the the uh, platforms of these two people. And so, as a reader, I look at that and I say, the the way that Jenny Wilson's platform is described is is done in a way that's very much like this picture. It's presented and spun in a way that is not flattering to her and is kind of blurry and hazy. And the way that Micah Bruner's platform is laid out is also done in a way that's very much like this photograph, that it, he is presented as, in, as clear and prepared and happy and, and in, a very, uh, in um, a, a very positive way. And so as I, as I think about our need to be able to participate in the adult world, which includes democratic participation, we need to be able to see, recognize this for what it is, and to understand and to think critically about these kinds of things. And there's no better place to prepare kids to do this than in social studies classes and history classrooms especially. And so that is kind of the, the focus that I want to talk about with this idea of critical uh, thinking. So you know, notice that on the bottom of the, the advertisement that I received, this is paid for by the Utah Republican Party. And so obviously, going back, you know, here's our Republican candidate, here's our Democratic candidate, and the Republican Party has, has painted their candidate in a very positive light. And so as a critical reader and a critical thinker and as a critical voter, I need to look at this and say, all right, I, this may or may not help me make a decision about who I'm going to vote for, but I do know that it's come from the Republican Party and it's likely to present things in a way that are very favorable to one candidate and unfavorable to another. I'm going to need more information before I vote than just this flyer. All right, so now this brings us to this idea of, of of history and the role of history and historical literacy. And so in my mind, teaching students historical literacy is a key to helping them be more critical in their voting and thinking about uh, 
the decisions they have to make in the adult world. And there are these six elements of, of thinking that I want to talk about with you just briefly. And uh, as I said before, if there are questions about any of these, just interrupt. And, and, uh, and I'm not sure, you know, good teachers know their students' background. I'm not sure uh, how familiar you are with these, these uh, strategies. And so if I'm talking about things that you're an expert on, then let me know. Let's, let's move on to other topics. So, so first of all is this idea of sourcing. And I'm going to give you some examples from Lewis and Clark. Uh, they're they're uh, explorers who uh, crossed the uh, western United States, early 1800s. They're the equivalent in America of what David Thompson is in Canada. Are, are you familiar with David Thompson? Is he, I wonder if he's as, what's that? Uh, well, we are in Quebec, and Thompson r rings no bell for us. Okay, but, so he's more out west, but he was he's a great explorer who even headed west before Lewis and Clark, a uh, Canadian. Uh, so, but Lewis and, have you heard of Lewis and Clark? Yes, yes, there were, there were from some French Canadian with them, so we heard from, from them because of that. There were some uh, French Canadian. Who went with them, so we heard from them. Sure, Charbonneau, who was their, one of their guides, Sacagawea's husband. Yeah, it was French. Well, so we're gonna we're gonna look at some sources that come from them and and kind of think critically about them. The way I would work with with students in a history class, and so sourcing involves looking at the at the genre. What kind of a document is this that we're looking at? So is it, a, is it an email? Is it a political advertisement? Is it a letter? Is it a speech? Author is who wrote it. And some of the questions we ask about the author is what was the author's involvement? In other words, was the author an eyewitness? Or did the author hear about it from you know, their, uh, a second source, their wife's cousin's uncle or something? Or did, are they a personal eyewitness to it? What's the author's perspective? In other words, what's, what's their viewpoint on things? Do they have something to gain or lose by the account that they're giving? And what's their background? Because we know that a person's uh, experiences influence the way they perceive things. And so uh, these are questions that we have to ask as we're looking at, at sources. And then we look at the audience. Who are they writing to or speaking to? And what's the purpose of... Um, of the account that they're giving. And so this, this is a quote from a letter that uh, Meriwether Lewis wrote to his mother just before he departed. And so the genre is letter. The author is Lewis. This is before he's left, so he doesn't really know much about how the expedition is going to turn out. But uh, let me read through this with you. He, he, he wrote to his mother, The day after tomorrow I shall set out for the western country. I had calculated on the pleasure of visiting you before my departure, but circumstances have rendered this impossible. My absence will probably be equal to 15 or 18 months. The nature of this expedition is by no means dangerous. My, and my, We're hearing some chuckles from my students because they're familiar with the dangers that they faced along the way. Uh, my route will be altogether through tribes of Indians who are perfectly friendly to the United States. Therefore, I consider the chances of life just as much in favor on this trip as I should conceive them were I to remain at home for the same length of time. So, what is... <laughs> so, there's a lot of reaction from my students to this, uh, kind of chuckles and things. What's going on here? Because we know that the, this was a dangerous expedition. We know that. So the question is, was he clueless about the dangers that we, he would face? Or, you know, what, what's going on? So Ben, one of my students, is saying he was writing to his mother. So that, I mean, that's a key to understanding this, is writing to mom. So at, at one point in the expedition, he uh, is out shooting buffalo to try to get 
uh, meat for the company. And he shoots a buffalo and he's watching it, you know, as it's dying. And he's standing there and he looks around, you know, at the other, the, the beauties of the scenery around him. This is by Great Falls, Montana. And as he's standing there watching, all of a sudden he, he looks behind him and about 20 yards away, there is a grizzly bear that's stalking him. And so he, he uh, turns with his gun, aims his gun at the grizzly bear, and then realizes immediately that he hadn't reloaded it after shooting the buffalo. And so he turns and starts to walk away from the bear. And as he's walking, he looks back, and that bear is coming at him full speed. And so the only there's no tree around. The only barrier at all is the river. So he runs out into the Missouri River and pulls out a, a pike that he had. And he's ready if that bear comes after him. And the bear comes to the edge of the river, uh, lets out a growl, and then for some unknown reason, I mean, it could have gone out and chewed him up, but for some unknown reason, it turned and, and took off running at full speed, and, and he watched it run across the, the a big plains and disappeared. Well, did he not know at the time? We look at this letter again. The nature of this expedition is by no means dangerous. Did he not know when he was getting ready to go that he would face these kinds of dangers? He probably had some inkling, but when we think about, again, like Ben was saying, when we think about his audience and that he was writing to his mom, then that, that letter starts to make sense. Uh, and we can also look in that same letter, there's this line as well. I go with the, with the most perfect preconviction of my, in my own mind of returning safe, and hope, therefore, that you will not suffer yourself to indulge in any anxiety for my safety. And this kind of tells you the purpose of this letter to his mom. He's worried about her, worrying about him. And so, you know, so he's, he's uh, making it clear to her, I'm going to be okay. So that's, so, so do you get this idea of sourcing and how it's done in historical reading? And then do you also understand the importance of teaching this to students so that they can look at the sources of the information that they're exposed to. I mean, does this make sense? Any, any thoughts or anything that you want to say? I'll take, I'll take that as a no. No. <laughs> I'm afraid through this. <laughs> Okay. What's that? Well, the, the, the computer stopped for a second, but everything is okay now. I, I was just writing down things about the letter from Lewis and Clark to his mom, and I was thinking from myself talking to my mom, so I relate to that. So I, I had a lapse of time. Sorry, I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. I. I, I think. Yeah, we had that, that same type of comment made here in the class that uh, he's writing to his mom and so in order to really understand it you have to understand the audience. The audience is not always vital to understand the source and, and to, to be engaged in sourcing. Sometimes you can understand fully what the message is without thinking about the audience but in this case you really need to know the audience and so the uh, what I was saying probably as things cut out is that in today's world in this internet age students, adults need to be able to be disposed towards looking at the source of web pages, advertisements, emails, and those kinds of things. And there's no better place to teach those kinds of skills than in a history classroom, in my opinion. So that's sourcing. A second, a second strategy that's associated with historical reading, additional sources. And this involves noticing similarities, noticing differences. Creation is cross-checking information that you find in one source with additional sources. And this involves noticing similarities, noticing differences, and then noticing gaps in your, in your information so that you can look for other sources to try to fill in those gaps. And so I want to give you an example of, of this from that same situation. So Thomas Jefferson who was president at the time that Lewis and Clark were sent, he wrote a letter to Lewis. And this letter was sent about two weeks before Lewis wrote to his mother. 
and and I I assume that he received this letter before he wrote to her. But this is what Jefferson says to Lewis. As it is impossible for us to foresee in what manner you will be received by those people, talking about the Native Americans out in the West, whether with hospitality or with hostility, so it is impossible to prescribe the exact degree of perseverance with which you are to pursue your journey. What he was saying was, uh, if the going gets rough, just turn around and come home. If it gets too dangerous, he goes on in the same quote to say, if you, it gets too dangerous, we don't want loss of lives, and so you know, come back home. You're going to be a small party, and uh, so just be careful out there. So corroboration then involves comparing side by side these kinds of things. So we have this quote. So we have this quote right here that comes from Jefferson. It's impossible for, to, for us to foresee in what manner you'll be received by those people, whether with hospitality or with hostility. And then shortly after receiving this, he writes to his mom, my route will be altogether through tribes of Indians who are perfectly friendly to the United States. He's lying through his teeth to his mother, you know. And and then a few a few days later, Jefferson writes another uh, letter to Lewis. It says, "Your party being small, it is to be expected that you will encounter considerable dangers from the Indian inhabitants." And so it seems like people in the West know very well that. This is a risky business, and that he really is, you know, not being tr completely truthful as he as he writes to his mom there. Okay, so that's so that's the idea of corroboration, and in in the today's world, again, corroboration is a vital strategy for students to learn. When you find something on the internet, a good way, a good rule of thumb is look for it in another source. Look somewhere else and see if you can. Uh, find corroborating evidence to support what you've found. So this is a historical thinking skill, but it's also an internet reading skill. Any any thoughts or questions or about corroboration? You guys stay awake? Okay. <laughs> okay, the third of the strategies then I wanted to talk about was this idea of contextualization. And this is maybe this is maybe the most difficult for young people to do and and also maybe one of the most important so contextualization is about stepping out of our uh, our world in 2015 trying to step into the world of, of 1803 and to experience what life was like for people then and so a few seconds ago we were talking about this question did he receive did lewis receive this letter get the Did Lewis receive this letter before he wrote this letter? And I think that as close as they were, Jefferson and Lewis at the time, that I think he probably had received it. And so, you know, those are the kinds of questions that you ask with contextualization. Is like things like, how was mail delivery in 1803? Where was Jefferson? Where was Lewis? Did they have informal communication besides this? Was Lewis really clear of the dangers that he was going to face? And I think there's a significant amount of evidence that, he, yes, he was clear on those things. So these are elements of contextualization. In my mind, these are some of the most important skills for students to, to develop because contextualization involves stepping out of your conditions and trying to put yourself in the conditions of others. And uh, whoever sent that email to me, I don't think had stepped out of their conditions or could maybe step out of their conditions and step into the conditions of the Muslim refugees that were fleeing into into Europe at the time that he wrote that that hateful email. And so more and more in this world I think we need to be able to take the perspective of others and contextualization is part of that process of assuming the perspective of others or trying to see the world as others have seen it. In the case of contextualization, it's going back in history, but it's a very similar process uh, of going 
to different geographic places and trying to understand the world um, that others are experiencing where they live. You ready for another? Yes. So inferring is another strategy that's vital for history. This is a strategy that goes across the board, not just for historical thinking, but any kinds of reading or, or really doing well in this world. You've got to be able to make inferences. So I, when I teach students this strategy, I talk about there's really two parts to an inference. There's evidence, and then there's background knowledge. And so the evidence comes in from letters from Jefferson that indicate the risk. We have a letter to Lewis's mother that minimizes the risk. And my background knowledge is this. I've done the same thing to my own mother. I remember once as I was leaving, she said, I, I, I don't have a criminal background. She said, this isn't, this isn't against the law, is it, what you're going to go do? I said, no, mom. And next she heard from me, I was in the back of a police car. <laughs> you know, this is when I was a teenager and we were out causing mischief. But, yeah, you know, I've done the same. I have the same experiences with my own mom. And, I, you know, as I thought about it, it's probably even more common to do so in 1803 with the gender roles of the time. Women were viewed as, uh, you know, the weaker sex and that in order to try to protect them, uh, I think it was very common at the time to uh, try to pr protect them from the fears that the, the, the men maybe had. And so the inference that I make is Lewis was well aware of the risks but downplayed them in his letter to his mother so that she would not be concerned about his safety. This is an inference, and it's an interpretation that's based on this evidence combined with this background knowledge that I have. And I'm, as I work with students, I'm very explicit about this process so they can know where good inferences come from. Because it's quite common for people that are not good critical thinkers to base their inference purely on background knowledge and not try to draw anything from evidence and their inference just springs out of their own experience rather than from, I'm, I'm, springs from, you know, it doesn't come from this evidence, it comes purely from their background knowledge. So I think this is a vital, and this is part of a mat, of contextualization as well, is trying to understand the context in the past. And so, uh, you know, another strategy that's vital in historical thinking is imagining. And when I ask students about this, they're really quite surprised to hear that imagination is a vital strategy. But historians recognize the, the role of imagination. But contextualization is, a, is an imaginative effort, trying to go back and go to a different place and imagine that context. Inferring involves imagination as you're trying to... Uh, combine your background knowledge w with things. Uh, a, a historical philosopher, uh, early 1900s, this is published after his death, but he, in the early 1900s he said that it's, it's the artist and not nature that is responsible for what goes into the picture. And he, he used that as kind of a metaphor and then taught that it's the historian and really not the past that's responsible for what goes into history. That just like an artist can put a tree where there is no tree, a, a historian also can has the liberty to create what is not necessarily right there. And, and I've done an example of that just a few minutes ago. So this, this inference that I'm making, this is not, this is not necessarily something that happened in the past, but this is my interpretation of the past based on the evidence that I've found. And so, you know, it's historians really are the ones that put the past together and they do it in imaginative ways, but tied to the evidence as much as they, as they can. All right. One or two more strategies is then associated with this critical thinking. One is skepticism. And so uh, when I look at that ad that I receive in the mail, I do so with just a touch of skepticism. 
I see a blurry picture of the Democratic candidate, and I chuckle a little bit, and I'm, you know, and I and I'm just a little skeptical about everything that I'm going to read on the back of it because of the way that that's presented. And his, historians have to approach their evidence with just a little bit of skepticism. So, for example, the statement to his mother that's not taken at face value. He, if I if I just took everything that I read at face value, then I would know that Lewis and Clark's expedition to the West was not dangerous. He's that right in the letter. But that's not true. The journey was dangerous. And even more skeptical, I, I don't think that letter even represents Lewis's true thoughts and feelings. I think that, that he's not being accurate in the way he really thinks and feels as he writes to his mother. And so as a reader, I can veto some elements of that letter. I don't believe he really thought the expedition was dangerous. But at the same time, I believe other elements of the letter. When he wrote, in two days I'll be leaving to go to the West, I don't doubt that part of it. And so the historian has, I, I think it was Weinberg, Sam Weinberg, that talked about the line item veto. And so with the line item veto, I can go through a document line by line and say, I trust this part. I don't trust this part. I trust this part. I want corroborating evidence on this part. And so there is this skepticism that kind of runs through that whole process of reading. All right. So you can see each of those things that come into play as I'm reading an ad like this. Or not all of them, but many of them come into play. And so I think these kinds of historical thinking and reading and writing skills really important for... Uh, for modern voters and consumers and and uh, citizens of nations. So, any any questions or thoughts about this idea? This then this critical aspect of you know how well, critical thinking. In fact, I would have two questions that maybe it is prematurely, uh, prematurely, premature. Well, okay. Uh, maybe it's too soon, but I will, I will ask them anyway. Uh, we, you, you will decide if it's too soon, and we'll talk about that later. But the first is, um, why wouldn't we uh, do that with uh, things from today instead of things from the past? For example, why in social studies class uh, classroom aren't we doing uh, the corporation thing? Or, every year that you talked about with uh, text from, for example, the voting uh, publicity you receive, instead of doing that with historical text, text uh, from the past or from textbook, whatever. If we want students to learn to be skeptical and uh, able to inquire by themselves, why don't we make them inquire by, by themselves with text from today? With, would be the, the object of their inquiry. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. The, the way I would respond to that is uh, when, you're, when you're teaching these strategies with the historical content, you're re there are really two things that you're accomplishing at the same time. And I know in, in the United States, I know this is not as true in Canada or England, but in the United States, our tradition in history classrooms has been content. It's content, content, content. There's very little focus on skills. And we still have that tradition. So the, con the historical content is really important uh, for, with policy makers. And so even as we try to reform history instruction in positive ways, we still have to pay a lot of attention to content. And so the the reason that we would, we would teach these skills with historical documents is because we're really teaching the content as well as the skills. Now, we also, there are some social studies classes that are taught here in the state, for example, there's a Utah studies class that is intended to be a real social studies class, and history is only part of the curriculum there. And so if I were to teach Utah studies, I definitely would bring in current events. And even if I teach U.S. history, 
I don't think there's anything wrong with bringing in current events and current documents and current things, but that can't be the focus of the instruction in a U.S. history classroom because of the, the tradition we have in the states of content coverage and just it's this all-purpose, you know, all all uh, inclusive notion of content. We got to cover all of the content. So does that help uh, clarify? Yeah. Yes, thanks. Uh, I see there is some questions from the uh, the other participants from um, around Montreal. Uh, I don't know if you can see them. I, I can't read them. It's too expressive. Uh, so we'll just activate the camera and the microphone for the first one. So. Uh, you should be able to read from uh, Stephanie in the chat window, and if she wants to activate his, uh, her microphone, she should be able to talk now. With her, with her Western Canadian accent. Okay. I can see her question. Should I just start talking? Yeah, go ahead. So the question is, how do you develop criteria for plausible use of imagination with students? I find that their imagination is often filled with presentism, and they struggle with the issues of plausibility when filling gaps. Do you know that's a that's a great uh, a great question as well. I last year I taught some uh, fourth grade students, and uh, one of the things that I was talking with them about uh, was historical imagination. And I, I use this example that I said, if, if, it, if we knew that Abraham Lincoln was in one city on one day and that he was in another city on, on the next day, our historical imagination could be used to identify how he got from one city to the other. Even if there was no evidence at all to explain how he got there, we might, if there was a rail line between these two cities, we might say he took the train. Or if there was no rail line, we might imagine that he took the, a carriage. But what we wouldn't be allowed to imagine is that he flew in a pink helicopter from one city to the other. Because historical imagination is constrained by the technology that was available at the time and, the, uh, and by plausibility. So we live in a world where there's things like gravity. And so our historical imagination has to take into consideration the existence of gravity and other kinds of physical laws. And so, th so about a week later, as I was working with these students, I had them imagine a mining town. And in Utah, mining was really big, turn of the century. And so I had these students imagine a mining town. And they we looked at some primary sources associated with mining towns. And then I had them sketch their own mining town up in the you know in in, in uh, the mountains they had a big piece of butcher paper and students were working in groups on these and as i looked at these mining towns after one of the groups had drawn this and they were supposed to be set in 1900 one of the groups had a heliport designed especially for pink helicopters so they had like gone directly against this they my metaphor against me and had had uh, it was their way of rebelling, uh, I suppose. And so I guess for fourth graders, uh, you know, historical imagination just has to run wild every once in a while. And, but by the time they get into seventh or eighth or tenth grade, if we keep reminding them about, you know, these are the rules of historical imagination. It's got to be true to the technology of the time. It's got to fit within the constraints of, of uh of the laws of physics and gravity and those kinds of things. And it has to stick to the evidence of the time as well. That was the other thing with the mining towns. We looked at photo after photo of the main streets of these mining towns and the streets were lined with hardware stores, saloons, uh, restaurants, another hardware store. And in these students' uh, towns, their streets were lined with Toy store, candy store, toy store, candy store. You know that. So they weren't quite ready to 
to uh, fit their imaginations to the evidence that they were they were given. But it's a great question. Something that we that uh, you know is a is a concern. Is that I I think that answers your question, Stephanie. I guess it does. I'm not, yeah, I'm not hearing from her. You can type another message if, if you want further explanation. Okay, thank you. Should I address Kevin's question? Is it possible to use the same concept of historical thinking with artifacts, not reading texts? So uh, my response would be yes, to some degree. Inference making is a vital strategy in working with artifacts. So what, to, when working with artifacts, sourcing is a little bit tricky. Corroboration, you can use something kind of like that. But really, the, the, the things that archaeologists, the strategies the archaeologists use above anything else are observing and inferring. And so with artifacts, I like to teach students, you know, let's make some careful observations. What do you observe? And then from these observations, what can you infer? And so, you know, those are strategies that are particularly useful with artifacts. Now, corroboration, you can, you can use that as well because you can take, especially with what they call historical archaeology, which is looking at artifacts that come from historical time periods where there are also primary source written records. And so you can take written records and you can corroborate those written records using artifacts. And so corroboration is a strategy that certainly can be used. But sourcing is a little tricky with artifacts because the source has to be inferred normally. Uh, all right. We're, we don't have a lot of time. And my students have to leave in a few minutes, but I'm going to let them go. But I'll, I'll stay with, uh, with you uh, online. Uh, you know, we have about 20 more minutes with that. So... Uh, are there other questions, or should I talk for just a little bit about this idea of empathetic, em, empathetic disposition? I'll move forward, so if you need to sneak out, you can sneak out behind me. All right, thanks. Yeah. So with with empathetic disposition this is this is a lesson that I, I used with uh, several different groups of students and it's about Kristallnacht which is uh, it's the night of the broken glass is kind of a turning point in the way the Jews were treated in uh, Germany so thanks Jeff yeah we'll see you so the question that I approach, well, as I talk to students, I give them a little bit of background and I say, Kristallnacht, this is uh, the night of broken glass. It's a series of coordinated attacks on Jews across Germany and Austria by Nazi stormtroopers and by civilians. You know what, I'm going to pull this over here now so I can look at this. Um, And so this is a time when Jewish homes and businesses and schools and synagogues were destroyed. Uh, the German authorities did not step in to stop it. This is just background information that I give um, the students. Some Jews were tortured and even killed. 30,000 Jews were arrested for their own protection. And so this is, so this I think is just a really vital question is, how could civilians think it was okay to do this to their neighbors? And what's going on? So you might think this is surprising, but when I'm talking about empathy in this case, I'm not talking about empathy for the Jews that were victimized. I'm talking about, with historical empathy, trying to figure out what's going on with the civilians that were perpetrating this. I want to be able to understand their actions and why they would engage in actions like this. And why do I want to understand that? Because I want to make sure that I am never pushed to engage in this kind of behavior. I've got to, I've got to watch myself 
And if I can understand what makes, because historical empathy is based on the premise that people typically do things that make sense to them. That there aren't, you know, it's only in Disney movies that there are villains who sing about being evil. Most people in their actions are trying to do what they see is good and, and right and, and just and fair. And so what, what could have been possessing the people that engaged in this abuse of their neighbors? So that's the question that I want my students to address as we're talking about Kristallnacht, because this really is a turning point in the treatment of Jews. We go from hating them to actual physical violence against them and vandalism of their property. And so now we can start to look at the evidence and what was it that could have caused these people to feel this way against the Jews. And th these are some of the sources that I looked at with students. So this is a book that was called The Poisonous Mushroom. It's obviously written in German, but the English translation is The Poisonous Mushroom, and it's published in 1938. And this is an excerpt from that book. A mother and her young boy are gathering mushrooms in the German forest. The boy finds some poisonous ones. The mother explains that there are good mushrooms and poisonous ones in it. And as they go home, says, Look, Franz, human beings in this world are a lot like the mushrooms in the forest. There are good mushrooms and there are good people. There are poisonous, bad mushrooms and there are bad people. And we have to be on our guard against bad people, just as we have to be on our guard against poisonous mushrooms. Do you understand that? Yes, mother, Franz replies. I understand that in dealing with bad people, trouble may arise, just as when one eats a poisonous mushroom. One may even die. And do you know, too, who these bad men are, these poisonous mushrooms of mankind, the mother continued. Franz slaps his chest in pride. Of course I know, mother. They are the Jews. Our teacher has often told us about them. So here we have, you know, in a way that's very much like that email that I received, we have these uh, this stereotypes and this othering where uh, people are seeds are being planted here that would let later lead to events like uh, Kristallnacht. So again, then, and I use several other other sources of of uh, from that time period to. Uh, return back to this question, why would civilians think it was okay to attack their neighbors on Kristallnacht? And then I can follow up with questions like, what do we need to be careful of? What do we need to be aware of? Uh, is there propaganda around us now that's trying to convince us to, be, to hate and to mistreat and things like that? And what can we do to be aware of those types of sources so that we don't uh, make the same mistakes that uh, have been made in the past? This is an element of what they call historical consciousness. This is another thing that's really big in Canada. Peter Satius is a great advocate of historical consciousness, and we don't talk about it as much in the States. Uh, so I, I think you're, you're probably ahead of the game about, with, with, when it comes to that. Uh, any questions or comments about you know, that idea of historical empathy? I think the most shocking thing is that we're talking about empathy towards not just not it's not just feeling sorry for someone but it's a cognitive process of putting yourself into the shoes of someone else and trying to see the world that they see as they see it and try to understand their deci decisions based on the values and the experience that the experiences that they've had so I'll pause for a second for questions Everything is good. Okay, we're ready to move on. I'll give you one other then example of of uh, this idea of historical empathy and starting and and trying to put yourself in the shoes of others. You, you may not know that in in our state, I live in the state of Utah. One of our claims to fame is the transcontinental railroad was completed here. There was a rail company working from the east, another working from the west coast, and they happened to meet in, uh, in Utah. 
and the final uh, rail of the railroad was driven here. And so in Utah, we studied transcontinental railroad quite a bit. So I was working with a group of fourth graders on this topic, and we were analyzing photographs that had to do with the completion of the transcontinental railroad. And so this is one of the photographs, and um, students would notice things like, you can see that this looks like there's a white foreman back here, and all of the workers, and there's, there's a white foreman here, it looks like. But then all of the workers are, uh, they appear to be Chinese. Uh, and, and this is like with artifacts, with photographs, the strategies of observation and inference are really important. So in this, students can observe that the two folks in this image that aren't carrying, well, this guy's got a pole. But this guy right here doesn't appear to be carrying a shovel. He's more of a supervisor and not really engaged in the manual labor. The others are. And then they analyze this, this image, try to figure out what's going on. And I gave him several other images. But these are two that uh, I wanted to, to show you because of, of what happens next. So then we look at this image. And this is an image taken to celebrate the completion of the railroad. And I, have, I help students analyze this by giving them little parts to look at. And I give them this chart. So I say, OK, first of all, we're going to write down observations here. What do you observe? And then uh, so on this side, of the, in the left-hand side, they're writing just observations. I see people holding a bottle of champagne, or it looks like champagne. I see people shaking hands. And then over here, they make inferences. So what can you infer based on the inferences that you see in this photo? And just like with the photographs, this little chart is a really useful way to have students analyze art, uh, artifacts and things like that. So then, to, to support students more, I break down the picture. And I say, let's look at it bit by bit. So let's just focus in on this section. Let's just focus in on this section. And let's focus in here and focus in here and, and focus just on this part. And Eventually, with, with the class that I was working with, the students, one of the students said, you know what I, I, I don't observe in this photograph is any Chinese Americans. There are no Chinese, all those Chinese workers, where are they at the completion of the railroad? And so this, this was a question that came up. Is, and as we looked into it more, we found that uh, the Chinese were excluded from the celebrations, but many of them continued to live in northern Utah where the railroad was completed. So we know they were there at this time, but it's an interesting observation that students made that none of them are present in this, in this photo. So uh, to me, in this case, their empathy is more the traditional empathy, that they have feelings of... Uh, anger, perhaps, for the Chinese Americans who did much of the work of the completion of the railroad but weren't invited to the celebration. And, uh, you know, I suppose at the time, I didn't think about it, but I suppose that I should have had them maybe engage in some historical empathy with these people and say, why is it that they might have excluded the Chinese, not allowed them to participate? And, and well, in fact, that's where the discussion ended up with this class is what are some aspects of our lives where we don't, where we exclude others, where we're not allowing others to participate. And, and that, I think, is a lesson that can be drawn from, from this experience as students really try to experience empathy for the people involved in historical events. So again, you know, you asked before about why not talk about today. And I think in great his history lessons, there are connections made to today. What does this mean for us? What can we learn from the mistakes made in the past? And, and what, are the, you know, what are the modern applications of it? So to kind of wrap things up, things up, how do these skills and dispositions give students a voice? I think one thing that it does, it allows us to see that opinions should be constructed rather than transmitted. And so, I get to decide my opinion. I don't have to necessarily just follow along with the crowd, follow along with my friends, or even 
follow along with my parents if there are cases where they maybe are uh, ha are following traditions that are unwise. So my con opinion is constructed, and my opinion is constructed based on evidence and based on data, rather than based on emotion and rhetoric and 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 anger and those kinds of things. This also. This kind of thinking shows that alternative interpretations are allowed as well. And so you may have within a classroom some people who think, no, I think Lewis really did think it was safe when he was going out there. I don't think uh, he knew the dangers. And, and his letter to his mom is, is evidence that he didn't know the dangers. Of course, I interpret that differently, but someone else might look at it and say, no, I interpret this as him being truthful to his mother. You know, who else would he, he wouldn't lie to his own mom. And that interpretation is allowed. And in fact, in politics and in the world, there are smart people, smarter than me, that vote different than me in every election. And uh, so students need to understand that just because someone has a different view or opinion than them, it doesn't mean that that person is necessarily wrong or, or evil, but that they see the world differently than than we do. They have a different perspective. And I think these skills of history help students develop that. It's these, these, these skills involve developing a better interpretation. So we can recognize and critique, critique propaganda. We can detect and consider bias. We consider the source. We can seek corroboration. And these are skills that will help us develop better opinions and more uh, and be more persuasive. And then we haven't really talked about writing at all. But my hope would be that we develop a students who don't create political advertisements like the one that I showed at the start. That they have better skills than that for persuasively presenting, persuasively presenting their interpretations.